I went on a TikTok bender the other night. A friend sent me a link to a bird's eye view of a gigantic Black Lives Matter protest by skateboarders in my hometown of San Diego. It was just thousands of skaters mobbing down the street next to Balboa Park and I was so excited about it. And then I just kept scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling for hours. Um, I saw grandparents twerking with their grandchildren, epic pranks, a million takes on the same dance moves, and lots of teenagers explaining to the world why until Black Lives Matter, all lives don't matter. I consumed hundreds, maybe thousands of stories before I finally broke myself out of the vortex and stumbled off to bed. The next day, a student who hadn't participated in any of my distance learning experiences since the end of March came to my last video office hours um, just to hang out and say goodbye. I told her about my TikTok bender and she said that she spends most of every day on TikTok just scrolling and scrolling and so do most of her friends. And this boggled my mind because first of all, not only was she watching TikTok when she could have been doing my work, but also because of the sheer number of stories that she and her peers are consuming on a daily basis. What is even happening in their brains? How are they making any meaning at all? But then I started reflecting on my own habits. How many stories do I consume every day? I feel like I have a pretty healthy relationship with social media, but I can't even count that high. Besides a random TikTok bender every once in a while, I'm also constantly listening to audiobooks and podcasts, watching Netflix and Hulu. I'm on all the social media sites. I'm reading the news, con communicating with my loved ones, telling stories, hearing stories, basically swimming in an ocean of stories. And I feel like I'm probably not alone here. This talk is called, the, or, no, this talk is part of a category called the power of narrative you know, pretty, pretty general topic. And the English teachers out there may have predicted that this is gonna be about telling a good story. You know, the common core definition of narrative. No. Most of you are social studies teachers though, so you're probably expecting me to make a case for diversifying the primary and secondary sources or narratives you include in your curriculum so as to avoid the danger of a single story. Well, I have spent countless hours working with colleagues to decolonize our history classes, and I do have many thoughts on the process, but it's been covered extensively by much smarter people than me in other places. While I have spent most of my 15 year career as one of the only white people in my classroom, I would rather not center myself in a conversation about how imperative it is that students learn about people who look like them, or that teachers strive to provide culturally responsive education. Just Google Zaretta Hammond or Chris Emden or look up hashtag EduColor or hashtag hip hop ed on Twitter. Those people can do a much better job than I can. Honestly, if you're a teacher who isn't actively trying to include diverse narratives in your history class, you should probably go spend some time working on that before you come back and watch this video because that's more important than this. So, even though I'm not a psychologist or even a psychology teacher, I would actually rather talk about the psychological theory of narrative identity, which says that a person forms their identity by integrating their life experiences into an internalized, evolving story of the self that provides that person with a sense of unity and purpose in life. Thanks, Wikipedia. Basically, as you go through your life, you sift through the millions of stories you encounter, including the stories that you experience, and weave them all together into one huge, powerful, internal narrative that you walk around with all day, every day. This narrative shapes how you, who, how you feel, who you are, how you interpret the world, and what you do about it. This is why Besides being an entertaining and handy tool for helping people remember things, narrative is powerful. As James Baldwin wrote, and the most recent season of Queer Eye quoted, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Our job as educators, therefore, is to help students face the truths of the world in a reflective and empowering way. 
And we can do this by helping them focus on their internal narratives. As an end of the year assignment, a colleague and I had our history students create their own primary sources, documenting life during the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020. Maybe you've heard of it. I read one journal after another where individual students began the two week time period that it was assigned during, mildly interested in the protests against police brutality that had started happening around the country, and then watching a whole lot of TikToks and Snapchats about the su subject, investigating on their own, having profound awakenings about systemic racism and the power of social movements, going to their first protests, finishing the two weeks, passionately hoping that the movement won't just be another passing fad, and even in some cases planning to attend the protests some of my former students had held in our neighborhood. My students felt so much more empowered than they did a month beforehand um, because of the kinds of stories they encountered changed and they were able to make meaning by weaving their stories that they were seeing into their own narrative identities. But how can we intentionally help students focus on their narrative identities in our courses rather than just kind of hoping it will spontaneously happen if we kind of arrange the right sources for them to read? Before we can do anything as teachers, like anything, first we have to capture their attention and then we have to hold their attention. And it's hard, right? What do students pay the most attention to? You guessed it, stories. And what's more, what's more interested than having a teacher tell a story is having peers tell them stories. So think about all this, all, think about the things that you have to teach in your class and then think about how you can get your students to tell each other stories about those things, whether they're stories from their lives or stories that, there are, that, that are their interpretations of the historical evidence that you give them. This is why it's especially important, like I said before, to make sure diverse stories are being told in our courses and also that we are teaching students and ourselves to pause the metaphorical scrolling every once in a while and reflect on the stories we're hearing. Meaning making comes from reflection, period. We also need to teach students how to filter through the chaos of a million billion stories, that ocean of stories that they're swimming through, and synthesize all of those stories into narratives. Interrogate those narratives and allow those narratives to evolve as they encounter different kinds of stories. Finally, we need to teach students how to share their stories and maybe even their narrative identities with the world. They need to learn how to write the press releases for the protests they plan, both literally and metaphorically. One of the best methods I've found for helping students do this kind of internal narrative work is through community interview assignments. The most profound interview assignment we do in my class is about migration. Each student is supposed to find somebody in their lives who's moved to Tacoma from another country or state and then ask them a series of questions about the push and pull factors that cause their migration, what their experiences were like after they arrived, what they miss about their old home, and what they like about their new home. Every year, students find out all kinds of new things about their families and their community members and say that they feel way more connected to these people because of the stories they've heard. And they, they come to the realization that asking questions about people's lives is a great way to connect. As we interrogate students' internal narratives, many of them discover that they, either they know way more migrants than they thought they did, or that they are not alone in having close relatives who moved here from somewhere else, um, and that they, their relatives have kind of similar experiences. Whether the people they interviewed moved here from Kansas, Georgia, Cambodia, the Philippines, or Mexico, students realize that there really is a common migration narrative and that many of these similarities be between stories of the now also apply to migrants from every time period in history. So what themes from your class can you have students interview their community about? What collections of stories can you have your students sift through that will resonate with the internal narratives that they're already walking around with? 
How can you help them deliberately interrogate and clarify their internal narratives? There are so many ways to develop these skills and I'm sure you all have great ideas and are probably already doing things like this already. But let's take this one step further. As we teach, we are telling our students all kinds of stories and only a very small percentage of the stories we're telling them are about our curriculum. We're also doing a thousand things every year that tell each student the stories of who we think they are. Whether it's through the points we give on assignments, our responses to their discussion comments, the things we choose to ignore, or the way we manage their behavior. The stories that we're telling our students are manifestations of our own narrative identities. So it is imperative that each of us interrogates our own narrative identity as teachers or about teaching. Why am I here? Who am I helping and why and how? What messages am I sending? Whose stories am I amplifying? Who am I neglecting and why? Did I make that decision based on evidence or assumption? What are my gen where are my generalizations coming from? Who am I trying to impress and why? What am I saying is important in my class? What do I want my legacy as a teacher to be? And then hopefully we can dig in and work together and do the hard work of asking these same questions about the whole public education system we can figure out whose stories need to be told more clearly and accurately and create a true, authentic, and beautiful narrative about a school system that truly empowers all of its students.